Coming up on Harvard Chan This Week in Health, the link between our genes and disease risk. We know a lot about how BRCA1 increases your risk of breast cancer in the setting of families where there are two sisters with the disease, or sister and mom, sister and aunt. The open question is, how does that work in the general population? A new study is shedding light on how genetic mutations may increase our risk of a range of diseases, from cancer to heart conditions. Hello and welcome to Harvard Chan This Week in Health. It's Thursday, December 8th, and I'm Amy Monomiro. And I'm Noah Levitt. Amy will begin this week with some new research on how genetic mutations can influence our risk of certain diseases, such as breast cancer or various cardiovascular conditions. We already know a great deal about how our genes can increase disease risk within families, but researchers at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Harvard Chan School wanted to see if those insights translate to the general population. For example, uh, one of the genes is BRCA1. So we know a lot about how BRCA1 increases your risk of breast cancer in the setting of families where there are two sisters with the disease, or sister and mom, sister and aunt. Um, so in those settings, we can say with reasonable certainty, given that you have this mutation, you have a such and such percent chan- lifetime risk of getting breast cancer and ovarian cancer. That's Peter Kraft, a professor of epidemiology at the Harvard Chan School. Um, the open question is, how does that work in the general population? So if somebody walks in, has their genome sequenced, maybe for something that has nothing to do with breast cancer, but it turns out they have one of these breast cancer mutations, what's their risk? Even though they don't have a sister who has breast cancer and their mom is perfectly healthy, and so there's no family history, but we don't, but they have this mutation. So the question is, are they also at increased risk, uh, and how much? So to try and answer that question, Kraft and researchers at the Brigham and Women's Hospital examined 3,700 people involved in two separate studies on heart disease and cancer. They screened participants for disease-causing mutations using a panel of 56 genes representing 24 cancer and cardiac conditions, things such as breast cancer, heart disease, or high cholesterol. And they then analyzed whether those who carried the mutations went on to develop associated conditions more frequently than those who did not have the mutations. And they found that people carrying these mutations were four to six times more likely to develop any of these diseases regardless of family history. In some cases, scientists know why a mutation causes a specific disease, but in others it's not clear. Peter Kraft says the power of genetics lies in the fact that it's not necessary to always know the why. One of the opportunities with genetics is we don't have to understand all the details of the biology if we can establish with some certainty that in fact if you have this mutation you are at increased risk. It's a little bit of a black box, but it's clearly reproducible and, you know, we see it over and over again. Somebody who has that mutation is at higher risk of disease. Um, That's that's potentially actionable um, because there might be things you can do to modify your risk that have nothing to do with the mechanism of that particular variant but are just good for you anyway. The long-term hope here is that doctors may one day be able to routinely use a person's genetic variants to predict and prevent future illnesses. Essentially, they'd be able to tell you what your lifetime risk is for a range of conditions. For example, says Kraft, some scientists have proposed testing all women for that BRCA1 mutation beginning at age 30. That kind of wide-scale genome sequencing is still a few years off, says Kraft. One barrier, he says, is cost and complexity. Another, we still need to learn more about our genes and these mutations. Kraft says larger studies are needed before these findings about genetic mutations can be used regularly by doctors. Right now, since this is still early days and we've only been able to do this uh, this genome sequencing for in, at scale for the last few years, a lot of times you sequence somebody and you'll find all kinds of variants that have never been seen before just because we hadn't done it that much. And so the Human Genome Project sequenced one person. So from 2001 until, let's call it 2010, we, that was our knowledge of genetic information, genetic variation in the human population was like one person. Um, so now we've done a lot more than one person, so we're starting to see more and more. So every time you do this, you see new mutations. And, but the, and the temptation was there, oh, I sequenced somebody who had breast cancer and I see these 50 mutations, you know, they're increasing this person's breast cancer risk. Well, they just may have been things that are perfectly benign. They just happen to be seen in somebody who had breast cancer. By doing larger and larger epidemiologic studies, we'll at least have seen these things before and be able to say, you know what, of the 150 people who have that mutation, um, 90% of them went on to get cancer. Um, that's something you should know. So understanding what are the health implications of these mutations, that's, 
arguably the bigger challenge, um, uh, and that's where folks who are working at a school of public health can make a contribution. And work is already underway to expand our knowledge in this area. Brigham and Women's researchers have launched the Personal Genome Sequencing Outcomes Consortium, which will track outcomes among healthy people who have been sequenced for predictive purposes. In other news this week, hospitals in the U.S. say that repealing the Affordable Care Act could trigger a, quote, unprecedented public health crisis. As we've discussed before, President-elect Trump and congressional Republicans have pledged to dismantle Obamacare. And according to the Washington Post, the American Hospital Association and the Federation of American Hospitals say a repeal of the ACA would leave an additional 22 million people without insurance by 2026 and would cost hospitals $165 billion. Separately, lobbyists for health insurance companies have a meeting with members of Congress to outline what they'd like to see happen if Obamacare is repealed. Among the key issues for insurers, continuing to subsidize some costs for low-income Americans, and keeping rules that encourage young and healthy people to sign up for health insurance. Insurers say those are key factors to creating a stable market for those buying insurance individually. There's more research out this week highlighting the health benefits of nuts. Scientists at Imperial College London looked at data from 20 prospective studies and found that even just a handful of nuts can reduce a person's risk of death from heart disease and cancer. In the study of 819,000 people, those who ate the most nuts reduced their risk for coronary heart disease by 29% and their risk for cardiovascular disease by 21%. That same group also saw a 15% drop in their cancer risk. Researchers say people can see benefits by eating about an ounce of nuts per day, equivalent to about two dozen almonds. Scientists say there's evidence that higher nut intake can reduce triglyceride and cholesterol levels. They're also high in fiber, antioxidants, and healthy polyunsaturated fats. And finally, this episode, we've talked in the past about the health effects of too much screen time for kids and teens. And while teens may have a reputation for being glued to their smartphones or tablets, it turns out their parents are racking up plenty of screen time as well. A study from the nonprofit Common Sense Media found that parents of kids aged 8 to 18 spent on average more than nine hours each day in front of TVs, computers, smartphones, and other electronic devices. 82% of that was defined as personal screen time, meaning that it was not work-related. A study last year from the same organization found that teens also average about nine hours of screen time, not including time at school or for homework. Tweens spend around six hours in front of screens each day. Despite all that screen time, more than half of parents say they're concerned their kids could become addicted to technology, while more than three quarters of parents say they are good technology role models for their kids. A recent report from the American Academy of Pediatrics urged parents to take steps to reduce technology use among younger kids, recommending one hour a day cap on digital media use for kids between two and five years old. So I'm with a philosophical question because we're producing digital media here. Is listening to a podcast on your phone, is that screen time, even if you're listening? An interesting semantics question. I think this podcast would count under digital media use, but not necessarily scream time if you're not watching the podcast, if that makes sense. And also, I'm not sure how many two to five year olds are listening to us. So it wouldn't it wouldn't fit in under that one hour a day cap. But well, parents, if you're listening, this is a very child friendly podcast. So we're happy to have them listen to to future episodes. Get him get him into public health news early. That's exactly. what I say. Right, exactly. <laughs> this can easily fit in their one hour a day. <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode of Harvard Chan This Week in Health. I'm Noah Levitt. And I'm Amy Montemiro. Coming up on next week's episode, the health benefits of happiness, why having an optimistic outlook may help you live longer. In the meantime, you can listen to any of our past episodes on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. <laughs>